Hello and welcome to The Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me elsewhere online as a sour telling, that's a sour telling, and that is my username on Instagram and Ravelry, where we also have a Ravelry group. Show notes and links for this episode, as usual, can be found in the down bar below here on YouTube. So hi, um, happy new year again, how are you doing? I didn't end up having a huge break over the winter holidays because I still had to go to work and I had a deadline on Friday the 3rd of January which has now been cleared so I have spent the last weekend blissfully just quietly making things at home as I've had the place to myself so there's quite a lot to cover in this episode there is a little bit of knitting some planning a lot of mending a bit of sewing and then at the end in conversational threads I'm going to be chatting to you about new year's resolutions new year's resolutions can be a little bit controversial and I myself am actually not very good at sticking to them overall but I've been making um some small changes in my life or aiming to do so over the last couple of weeks which kind of just coincides with new year's resolutions for example one of which is to drink more water because i feel like i'm dehydrated a lot and um shout out to this beautiful 1960s uh, i think it's a scandinavian glass carafe that my mum gave me for my birthday so um yeah one of the things i've been doing is just filling this up to the top every day because when it's right at the top it's a litre of water and then just um getting through that systematically so i'm sitting here with um, my customary cold tea and also a glass of water. Let's get straight to it. What's in my knitting basket? So the Crimson Whip Along has ended now and so if you had entered the Crimson Whip Along by you know posting a list of um, unfinished objects in the in our Ravelry group, if you if this rings a bell, if you have any vague memories of doing that over the last five months or so, this is the time to put an entry into the whip along winners thread if you have successfully completed 50% or more of your whips. I'm really delighted to say that I did manage to um, finish 50% or more of my whips. I can't remember the exact um, numbers, but um, yeah, so at the moment what I've been doing is just trying to finish off the last few things that I was doing and that includes this orange cardigan which um, I started in September so this was a new cast on that I did um, not, not a kind of old languishing project and it's knit in this amazing orange um, it's looking pretty fluorescent from what I can see on the camera screen um, but it is just a really bright rich true orange but it's not it's not fluorescent it's literally like an orange that you would eat um, and it's made in this beautiful Portuguese yarn that's a blend of linen silk and cotton so it's quite heavy and pretty drapey and I cast this on you know when you just get a bee in your bonnet about doing something like you just have to knit it now um, and I did that in September and I had this mad idea that even though I had only three weeks I was going to knit the whole thing whilst doing everything else that I had to do um, in preparation for my trip to Southeast Asia so that I could wear it in air-conditioned places but that totally didn't happen um, so over the last week or so what I did is I got the pieces together it's knit bottom up I got the pieces together on the needle and I started working on the lace yoke with raglan decreases and um if I show you the back you can get a sense of the lace pattern it's these slightly asymmetrical and very pointy leaves but what I like about it is the fact that when you hold it back which is hard to see with my face kind of with the light but oh yeah if you hold it back you ultimately get this very nice chevron zigzag pattern and I love a chevron oh there we go look at that gorgeous so that is coming along I'm more than halfway through the yoke I'm making a lot of pattern alterations as always oh the pattern is from a back issue of Pom Pom Autumn 2013 that I've had in my stash since Autumn 2013 because I had a pattern published in it and it is this sweater that is on the back that was knit, um, this one in the sample was knit in a hand dyed yarn in orange and I've stuck to the orange theme but not in a hand dyed yarn um, in a plant in well plant fibres apart from silk which is obviously an animal fibre because of the silk worm um, but yeah it's it's quite heavy so yeah as I said I made a lot of alterations the type of yarn being significant secondly I added in pockets 
which you can get a sense of here. Um, they're not massive, but they're enough for a little handkerchief or a tissue or a ticket stub, things that I seem to amass or a hairband. Um, and then the other main alteration was that I completely changed how I did the button bands because in the pattern it's a crew neck quite high up and then just a few buttons here then it opens out which is obviously quite a popular style I'd actually say earlier than 2013 I'd actually say like around 2007 it was a really popular style of knitting like top down raglan only a few buttons and then let it split open I myself did some patterns like that as well um, so I'm changing that and I'm changing it to be more of a v-neck um, with my first so I've done the buttons from the bottom up and then I stop the button holes round about when the lace yoke starts um, here it's kind of hard to demonstrate and show you and then I'm doing you can get a sense that I'm doing decreases here um, for kind of slowly sloping not dramatically sloping v-neck but I've got a feeling that once it's on the body because obviously your bust and your breastbone pushes the fabric out I've got a feeling that once it's on the body the v will actually look a bit more pronounced and it's got um, a couple of inches of positive e so it's going to be very loose and the fabric is very loose and drapey in order to um, achieve the correct tension so I'm really looking forward to have this um, done for the summer, for the later months. So I suppose it's really good that um, I'm knitting it in January because by the time it gets warm it will just be ready to go. So that's this one, I'm calling it my orange silk cardigan, I can't even remember what the pattern name is, but yes, from a back issue of Pom Pom because um, a few years ago I went through all of my knitting magazines and pattern books and I earmarked all of the things that I wanted to knit that I liked and I put post-its on those as little bookmarks and I basically said to myself that I, I wasn't going to buy any more books and magazines until I had knitted <laughs> knitted all of the things that I like amongst my existing pattern library. So I do occasionally buy PDF pattern downloads, you know, when it's just a single pattern that I really like, that I just, I get that and then I make it as and when. But on the whole, I'm doing my best to knit through the patterns in my existing knitting library. Um, and also when it comes to books and you know publications in general I'll only buy it if I like at least if I if I think I'm going to knit at least um three items in the book so if it's just one then I I I don't allow myself to buy it I'm going to chat a little bit more about this at the end in relation to stashless 2020 so keep watching to find out more about that so the other thing that I've been actively working on is an extra Christmas sock um, which I showed that I had done um, another pair in this Holly Berry West Yorkshire Spinners Christmas colourway in the last episode and then I have enough yarn left over to knit a second pair of socks so I'm just going to do that and again it's super in advance these are going to be for me and um, the other pair I gave to my partner for Christmas um, so I'll just put them at the back of my sock drawer I'll, I'll wear them if I really need to but they'll just be ready to go for next Christmas and that was that was quite fun because I don't do a lot of Christmassy things and this year was a bit tough because we weren't at our place we were at different relatives places for Christmas and moving around quite a lot so it got quite tiring to be honest with you but um yeah I'm looking forward to having a pair of Christmas socks in the sock drawer for next December. One more thing that I've been knitting on I can't believe that it just slipped my mind but my caterpillar jumper <laughs> I can't even say with a straight face because I can't believe that I forgot that I had a finished object that I was meant to share with you guys. So I finished my caterpillar scrap jumper and I finished it um, literally on Christmas day. I wove in the last ends and I bound off the uh, cowl polo neck um, bind off and it's done. So this was the project that um, was one of the older projects on my whip along list that I managed to clear um, not like with this one as opposed to the new cast the many new cast ones that I just cast on and finished 
kind of a weird phenomenon that seems to have followed everybody around or at least most people around in the thread um so yeah this is my k facet inspired jumper from a back issue of rowan again relating to my practice of trying to knit, knit up old patterns in my library and it is a it's a scrap jumper, it is what it says on the tin. So I sewed it together and last time I was kind of concerned because I thought it was very long and wide, but actually I, I don't mind. And it is very wide, like when I'm wearing leggings as opposed to a skirt, it, it, it has a, even more of the wide effect and it kind of billows around my torso. Um, but the sleeves are quite nice and fitted, they're the right way. And the polo neck, I knitted a lot less rows than they than they called for and it's and it's quite fine. Um, I seamed it but I hadn't blocked it, but yesterday I just pressed the polo neck on the ironing board with a lightly steaming iron and a damp cloth underneath it and that worked out really nicely sorry just realized i had a necklace on underneath it still um due to my magical costume change <laughs> so yeah this is this um i don't really know what else to say about it i've been wearing it loads it's really fun i initially felt a bit odd about this green chenille because basically the yarns there's loads of different yarns and they've got different textures so I've got um, whole super soft here which is slightly hairy but quite smooth overall I've got this Danish um, pelt, pelt wool pelt ult, um, which is much more hairy then I've got um, chenille totally different texture. I've got this really fluffy stuff which was um, literally given to me by someone who was clearing out a cupboard, more of the fluffy stuff. Um, and then this is like alpaca that's been held double with a wool and with a slightly, there's another bit where you can see it's slightly t more tweedy. So there's all different textures and the chenille is, is cotton and everything else is different blends of wool. So obviously it stands out quite a lot. Um, and I felt a bit bizarre, I felt like it was a bit weird, but I've actually got used to it and I now, I now don't mind. And I think when I eventually wash and block it, just from a little bit of color bleeding and so on, like the brightness of the bright green chenille will dull down a little bit. Um, and that will be that will be great. But um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I've been wearing it a lot, and <laughs> can't believe that I forgot to put this on at the beginning of the episode. So there you go. I'm going to carry on looking like a lollipop. So this project was the one that finished off my entry into the whip along, trying to knock off 50% of the existing works in progress that, that we have just lying around the house. And um, that was a really successful experience for me, and I know many of you guys because you have written me lovely comments on YouTube, on Instagram, and in the Ravelry group too. So thank you so much to everybody who participated, who joined in, who got in touch. And again, a reminder to post your successful entry into the Whipple on Winners thread if that is relevant. And I just want to highlight the prizes um, for that. The thread closes on Friday and I will draw the prizes over the weekend. So for the next podcast video, I'll announce the winners. So the prizes are as follows. There are two grand prizes of a kit of your choice from the Cozy Collection by Wool in the Gang. And I was wearing my version of the Amanda sweater that I also knit up as part of the knit along. So I reviewed this kit in much more detail in a back episode of the Crimson Stitchery. So I'll put a link on screen and below for you to check out my full review. Um, spoiler alert, I loved it. it even though I'm an experienced knitter and you could argue that some Wool and the Gang products are more, a bit more aimed at beginners, um, I thought it was a great experience because it allowed me to try something new that I would never have done, which was knit a huge bulky weight sweater in this really soft shade of pink. Um, I just wouldn't have gone out and bought the materials to do that because I tend to knit things on four millimeter needles or smaller, which I think is a US 7. Um, and this was knit on 12 millimeter needles and 15 I think and they were literally like the size of my fingers it was really odd but I really liked doing something new and it's nice to just mix it up a little bit every now and then there are also lots of other things that I liked about their product such as their packaging and the way that they presented their knitting patterns and instructions so do click over to the past episode to check out the full review so there are two um, kits from the cozy collection being donated for the prize draw which is really exciting um, shipping restrictions apply the other wonderful prizes are all pattern download prizes which is 
so fabulous. And they're being split across the Whippalong Chatter thread and the Whip Whippalong Winners thread. But basically, because um, there are fewer posts in the Whippalong Winners thread, you've got a much higher chance of winning something in that one. Um, so the prizes are as follows. Tess Young has donated a few copies of her Tito Alba cowl pattern. A really fun little textured project that's a beautiful little knitted accessory. So there's that. Um, Jacqueline Salem of Brooklyn Knit Folk Podcast has donated a range of patterns and once again really beautifully textured designs, photographed gorgeously as well. Thirdly, Bani Redesigns has donated a couple of copies of her Grisham shawl, um, which is a really fun and experimental project which, which she suggested would be great for using up scraps, so that's something that we do quite a lot, the Crimson Stitch Tree, using up leftovers and it's so nice to see a design that is so suitable for this kind of you so that's really fabulous and lastly we have a gift pattern donation from Yonder Woman Melinda on Ravelry and on YouTube and Melinda is going to buy a winner a pattern of their choice up to seven US dollars which is really sweet so thank you so much for that Melinda so yeah two fabulous kits and a range of different PDF pattern downloads I think that that is so exciting I think that everybody stands in a pretty good chance of winning something to be honest with you and I'm immensely grateful to everybody who has donated a prize of course thank you so much for your generosity and your enabling of the Crimson Whip Along which was a massive success so thank you everybody again. Right let's have another costume change. Here we are back in my Amanda sweater. I've uh, got to say, I always did used to love that series Sabrina. Not Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but the 1960s series Sabrina, where she's like a housewife that can't be bothered to do any cleaning, so she like magics the vacuum cleaner and stuff like that. And she has like this fabulous mother who's this genie in the bottle kind of figure who just appears in sequined caftans and causes havoc and has like incredible turquoise pe and peacock blue eyeshadow. Uh, hopefully you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this was my little chance to become Sabrina. Oh, and I think she wiggled her nose. She wiggled her nose a little bit as well, but that's kind of, I mean, I might be wiggling my nose anyway, but it's just because like fluff from this jumper is migrated towards my nostrils. So yeah, clicking your fingers is a bit more <laughs> proactive <laughs> magic. Um, I'm still giggling about the fact that I forgot to tell you about a finished object that I was genuinely delighted about and have barely managed to stop wearing. It's kind of just a coincidence that I didn't start the podcast wearing it because I've been wearing it most days around the house. So that's my knitting basket, looking pretty full. Things are going pretty well there. Um, and let's move into mending stories, which I haven't done in the podcast for a little while. And I've got a huge pile here to show you now. So let's go through all of this. Um, for anyone that's a new viewer and indeed hasn't managed to watch a Mending Stories segment, <laughs> it's normally what I do after talking about what I've been actively making in terms of new things. I love to talk about what I've been repairing um, because I've been trying to make mending a much more regular part of my personal practice. It's successful and less successful at different points um, because basically I was feeling quite intimidated by the fact that my mending pile was ginormous and I wasn't wearing any of the clothing that was in it and I was trying my best to make mending, you know, doing a little bit often with mending. But it, anyway, it piled up again recently and um, on Saturday I had a lovely clear morning in which I could just very slowly and calmly work my way through quite a lot of things. It's still enormous but um, sometimes Sometimes a little and often thing is, is useful and successful, but at other times you really do just need some dedicated headspace and physical space in order to do it in. So the first thing I'll show you is a skirt, sequin blue pencil skirt that I made from leftovers of a job, a costume job that I did, and I made it originally to wear to a birthday party. Um, and I made it using, yeah, so everything was using leftovers. The zip was in my stash, the top fabric was leftovers from a job, the lining fabric was like in my mum's stash from 1995. I didn't even tell her that I cut into it because what she, what you don't know won't kill you, but at this point the fabric was 25 years old and it was time to use it. So yeah, I'd made that, um, 
using kind of couture style sewing techniques that I taught myself from a book published by Claire Schaefer, a really amazing book. I'm gonna put a link to it down below for you to check out. Um, so I sewed it properly using lots of proper, proper techniques. And part of that included making a really, really strong waistband. However, although the skirt was cut to kind of skim my body in a nice flowing way, I got a bit carried away with making a really strong waistband that wouldn't stretch out over time. And that ended up being my downfall um, because basically I put on weight, but also put on muscle, like put on muscle through my legs and my glutes and all of that kind of thing from like running and swimming and stuff like that. And the skirt didn't fit me anymore. And it was relegated to the back of my closet for quite a long time. And it was going in and out and in and out of like donation piles to charity shops, donation piles to my friends, giving things away to my friends that I'd outgrown um, because of my growing legs. <laughs> And in the end, I didn't have a heart to give it away. And I'm so glad that I kept it because all I had to do was take off the waistband and suddenly the rest of the skirt did actually still fit me. So it wasn't that the skirt was too small. It was literally that the waistband was too small and too rigid. Um, so yeah, I just unpicked that. Um, by the way, when I say that I made things properly with like couture sewing techniques, one of the things that I mean is regarding things to do with fastenings, like these um, hooks are sewn on very carefully with buttonhole stitch, and then instead of using metal uh, eyes, I again created button loops by hand using thread. Um, don't ask me, don't ask me why. Sometimes I just get it into my head that I have to do things properly even though I don't work in, in an atelier. Um, so yeah, that was quite a relief. And then I found some what's called cabbage, which was like literally scraps of fabric that were left over, remnants like down salvage and stuff. And I was gonna recut the waistband, but at this point it was like five o'clock on New Year's Eve and I had cracked open the champagne already. And my friend just said to me like, is anyone gonna know that you've not done it properly? As in like cut a new waistband and sewed it properly. And I said, no, no one's gonna know, but it's really hard because, you know, I studied costume and I worked in costume professionally in the past and I've just got it into my head that if you're gonna do something, you've got to do it the right way. And then she said to me, well, if you just bought the skirt from H&M, would it have a proper waistband? I was like, no, of course not. And then that kind of just hit home. I was like, yeah, it wouldn't. And if I bought a skirt in a charity shop, the waistband might just be like a piece of elastic that was overlocked onto the top with no reinforcement at all, because I've seen stuff like that. And I just wear the skirt on the night out. You know, I'm not gonna be wearing it every single day of the week, but how fabulous would that be? But I'm not, um, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. So in the end, I, I did a very simple and quick and dirty fix in that I did a line of stitching to secure the um, fabric and the lining, and then I just folded it down on that stitch line, and then I like zigged and stitched down a second line. So now, instead of having a waistband, it's just folded over as a folded hem that's even been stitched down with machine stitch onto the outside. Definitely not doing things properly. You can just about glimpse the seam line there but it more than did the trick. And actually the fact that it was able to stretch out a little bit more was very beneficial when it came to lots of wild dancing on New Year's Eve in a warehouse club. So that was great. Um, and I was so glad like to have this skirt back. So glad that I didn't give it away to my friend who is much skinnier than me and tiny like a little elf. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can still wear it. So that felt really, really good. Um, that's kind of an issue that I have with decluttering. Like sometimes you're glad that you've got rid of stuff and you're glad that you've got rid of stuff that is genuinely useless. Like uh, too many empty plastic Tupperware boxes, half of which are cracked. Like they can go, you don't need to keep them. Too many eyeshadow palettes that you never use but people give them to you as gifts. You don't need to keep them. But quite a lot of the time when it comes to clothing and jewellery, I end up regretting getting rid of it because I love clothing and jewellery and it's a big part of my life. It is what I have done three academic degrees in and worked in professionally. It's really meaningful to me. I don't think that clothing is frivolous. I think it's 
it's a central part of human experience, dressing the body that is, um, and it's something that is found in all cultures all around the world for thousands of years, the importance of dressing the body. So clothing, no it's not frivolous, it's not excessive. Whether you consider it fashion or you know craft, hand making, whatever, whatever kind of little subsphere it falls into. Moving along in my pile, the next fix was pretty easy, it's in these fabulous pink corduroy trousers that were just a little bit too long so I did a very easy fix in that I simply turned the existing hem in under itself again and then I slip stitched along that in order to fasten it to the top fabric. So it's slightly bulky now and you can get a sense of that here, you can see a little bit of the line of the hem but I didn't want to cut away any fabric at this stage. So another mend for me and I'm really excited about getting these back in my wardrobe in a way that won't also bring lots of mud into the house when they trail on the floor. The next mend was something that I've been putting off for quite a while, it's on a duvet cover where the butt buttons had all fallen off so I just went along with a packet of metal poppers and I sewed in poppers in place of the buttons by hand so this will now make it much easier to get the duvet cover on and off so I did that all around the whole duvet cover with the exception of one existing button that was still on there that I decided not to replace. So I'm just gonna leave that one there because, you know, why give myself more work than I need? And I've got all of these poppers on, so that will bring this duvet cover back into use. Um, next three men's I've got were for my partner, as always. So <laughs> he had split his pants in different places. I'm not sure why or how, he's pretty hard on his clothes and he also buys most of his clothes secondhand, so they're already kind of worn out and then occasionally he'll do something like try to do capoeira while, while wearing corduroys. Don't ask me why. Um, he loves capoeira. Um, so the first one was a very simple split in the back seam of the crotch. So all I had to do there was just open it up and do another line of stitching. That was easy as pie. Next pair of trousers um, was also split in the seat, but this was slightly different because rather than the seam actually breaking, um, the fabric was actually wearing away, and this is a pair of kind of woolly, more woolly style trousers, a little bit tweedy. And because of that, I could have darned it, but I decided not to darn it, and I just did a patch. Um, so this is it from the right side. You can see frayed fabric on this side, but it's quite far down into the crotch seam, so it will be between his legs, so you shouldn't see it too badly. And on the inside, the closest thing I could find with the colour was the wrong side of some scraps of denim. I didn't have any grey wool. Um, so when you're patching, the main thing is to try and find fabric of similar weight first and similar colour second. The weight is more important um, than the colour. So this denim was heavy enough and as I said the wrong side was a grey so I just popped that in the wrong side and then I zigzagged around the patch to stop it fraying and then I zigzagged all up and down the holes and I did the same thing in the around the crotch where the larger hole was, you can see a lot more zigzagging there. And when you're doing patches, it's really important to cover a much larger area of the fabric than the hole is in. So you can see the hole is only here, but I've gone all the way around. Um, and the reason for that is because you want to sew the patch onto strong fabric, not onto fabric that's worn away. And the other thing that is important to do is to try your best to match the grain lines of the fabric. So don't just put the patch on any old how. Make sure that the grain lines are lined up. So that's that. A um, little, bit, little bit visible there. Um, but as you can see, once you kind of imagine holding it up, it, it's pretty minimal, I think, in the long run. And yeah, if people are staring at his behind, then they can expect to get more than the usual eyeful. Um, <laughs> the third mend is on a pair of corduroys and this was more challenging. Again it had split in the seat but it had split quite severely 
across the inside of the seat. Now you're so obviously now you're seeing it with the mend, but it it had it, it was a really big hole and um you know it'd come away in all four pieces. So that was quite challenging to think of what to do there. Um because loads of fabric had worn away. Um yeah, like I said, probably because this was existing a second-hand pair of trousers anyway. So there were some other things that I had to do. This belt loop had um, pulled off and in doing so had pulled a hole in the fabric. And I knew that I had to shorten the trousers anyway. So I went ahead and shortened the trousers and I kept the offcuts and I actually unpicked the hem of the other offcut that I had so that I'd have even more fabric to work with. And then I used the fabric that I'd used that I'd cut off in order to create a patch over the hole under the belt loop and then sewed the belt loop on. So as you can see, I just stitched this one on by machine onto the right side and then I didn't even bother to do anything on the wrong side. So the hole is still there, but if I wanted to, I could like do some stitching around that hole, but I'm not going to. Then on the inside, I did a lot of patching very carefully and here you can get a sense hopefully of how I've matched the grain lines and I basically patched around the trouser piece and built up the shape of the trouser piece that was existing that had all been worn away and I did this on um, on two sides on the front and the back uh, and then after I, it was, it was quite complex to be honest with you, and it, and it took a long time and it required a lot of patience, you know, slowly ziggered the pieces round, slowly went back in and ziggered on the top to reinforce. And then on the worst part of the hole, which is this point right at the top of the crotch where the four um, leg seams join up, I then put a piece of cordray on to cover it again. So that bit's got a couple of layers there. And I was running out of fabric at this point. I know I've, I've got a bit here, so I'd have had to have created like extra patches on top if I wanted to cover all of the rest of it. But I basically got bored and couldn't be bothered because I'd already spent a couple of hours on them at this point, or an hour maybe. Um, so I just covered it up at the worst point of the hole and then I just did extra zigzag stitches with the machine um, in the other bits around. So that was really, that was quite difficult because I had to build up the trousers again out of nothing and obviously it was all fraying away and disintegrating. So it's challenging. And um, it could be more invisible, as I said, I could have covered up more of the fraying away patches with um, other little scraps of top fabric. But as it is, I'm pretty happy with this mend. And also given that this was the worst pair of trousers, I feel like it's like the most invisible mend out of all. You can only get a glimpse of the thread because it's not an exact colour match, but it's as close as I could get with what I had. And I'm pretty happy with that. So quite a lot of mending this week and then let's go into sewing neat segue this is really a trouser filled episode there's one two three four five six pairs of trousers so i finished making the pajama bottoms for my partner um i didn't manage to give them to him for christmas so i'll give them to him for our upcoming anniversary instead because i'll make him something for that and they're just in yeah this lovely heavy burgundy cotton checked fabric and i kind of did my best as you can see to match the checks across the crotch that's the back there that's the front and yeah it's a pretty good um it's a pretty good match not completely perfect but they're a pair of pajamas it's fine and they've got inseam side pockets which are cut in the same fabric but i cut them along a different grain line so they mostly match but not not completely and then in order to mark the back i have sewn in a little piece of velvet ribbon here, which I love to do, just have that bit of velvet texture, it makes it seem very luxurious. Then obviously you know the front and the back. So that's the pajama bottoms, and I've got tons more fabric in which to make a pajama top with, and I'm in no rush to do that because sewing with checked fabric is challenging. That is the best word that can be used to describe it. You could also describe it as a pain in the veritable neck but not the neck because you know what pain I really mean um so that's that he'll get those he's he's pretty excited about it and then I've also been working on a pair of pajamas for myself 
I cut the pyjama bottoms out quite a while ago um, and I'm using this absolutely fabulous, fabulous cotton and steel cotton fabric which has like an American designer but is made in Japan except that it's been discontinued um, and it's called like Cat Lady and it's basically these blue polka dots that are like moons and then these cats faces with little pink pink little smug cat faces in but the thing is that I bought this co cotton fabric while I was on a trip to Singapore on a research trip in um, 2016 and I snuck in a little bit of fabric shopping and I bought enough for a dress, I think I bought two and a half metres I then decided that I didn't want a dress covered with cats um, and what I'd really like was a pair of pyjamas covered in cats instead but I bought two and a half metres and I had a pyjama pattern that required four to seven metres of fabric um, and this fabric has been discontinued so I did lots of internet searching and I did find a few places from the US that do still retail the odd metre like two metres left or one metre left so it is possible that I could have ordered some more fabric but it would have been expensive taken a long time there might have been customs charges and I just decided in the end to try my best to use what I had so you can see here that when I was cutting out the fabric pieces I made a lot of changes I shortened the bottoms I shortened sleeves and I put in cuffs in different color fabric um, I made the trousers really much narrower um, because they were very very wide, I made the top narrower, I made the top shorter, um, I cut the facing separately and so yeah I just decided to try and challenge myself and here's the lovely blue floral cotton that I have chosen to complement it. And it's had varying success because I had so little cloth that I couldn't actually cut the full trouser leg so I Frankensteined it in and I pieced it in with extra scraps of fabric around the fork and um, you can get a sense from that if I turn them inside out and you can see how many bits of fabric including a gusset like or maybe you can't see but look there's that 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 there's like four pieces of fabric um, when there should there should only be two and the same on the other side and then when I tried them on they were too tight so I added in a little gusset and it's a bit of a shame to be honest with you because I love the cut of the trousers in terms of the width of the leg I think it's actually perfect but just because there's so many seams around the fork around the crutch um, when I put them on, I can just feel all of that excess fabric. Even though I use tiny seam allowances, um, it's just it's just kind of there and I can feel it rubbing at my inner thigh. Now I will say that when I was just testing these out by sitting on the sofa and knitting, I was really aware of all of that fabric around my legs and it didn't feel very nice. But when I tested these out by getting off my bottom and doing some laundry and was like moving around the flat and the garden and hanging things up, I completely forgot about the discomfort. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame, but I will say that I, I think I'm going to get used to it. And also my grandma pointed out that as I wash these more, the fabric will just naturally soften and hopefully the seams and stuff will soften and stop kind of rubbing against me so much. So fingers crossed that I can deal with that. Um, so the pyjama bottoms were super easy to sew, apart from all the piecing. Um, and then, just at this weekend, I started working on the pyjama top as well. And I've got two lovely little patch pockets, again, in the gorgeous floral cotton. Um, so this top fabric with the cats and the polka dots, I think it was intended as a quilting cotton. So it's really heavy and thick and very soft and really quite perfect for pyjamas. However, the contrast fabric that I had from my stash is some cotton lawn, so it's very, very fine and thin, completely different quality to the main fabric. So actually, if you, if you remember what I said earlier about how it's important to match the weights of fabric when you're patching, it's the same when you're using contrast fabric. Um, you want to match the weight. So obviously, this cotton lawn was way finer than the quilting cotton. Um, and that would make it unsuitable for use as contrast trims and stuff like that. So what I did, quite simply, was I interlined it with some 
plain poly cotton that was existing in my stash, some plain polyester and cotton blend. I used to use it a lot for linings, I use it less now because I use more silky things. So I've got loads of it hanging around, it's not particularly nice, it's a bit scratchy, but it's fine for interlining. So I did that for the pocket, and then that brings it up to the correct thickness. Um, and I did the same thing for the trouser cuffs. So yeah, I've done that. So. Um, the next time I have a nice, calm, free sewing day, I'm going to be preparing the facings out of the contrast fabric and also the collar out of the contrast fabric. And then I've got sleeves cut out out of the main fabric and then I've got the contrast fabric for little sleeve cuffs. So this is this is going to be really lovely. Um, yeah, just a bit of a shame about the pyjama buttons kind of chafing, <laughs> which is not great, but it was it was really important to me just to use use what I have and just kind of make the best of it really um, and yeah that's kind of that's been a big part of my making philosophy for a number of years now and that brings me across quite nicely into conversational threads which is the last part of the podcast where we just have a little chat and a discussion about different themes surrounding creativity, creative practice and living. New Year's resolutions have been on my mind ever since on Christmas day my father-in-law asked me what are my new year's resolutions and at that point i didn't have any and i said oh i oh I, I don't think i have any and he was really surprised and he told me that in his life if on new year's eve he didn't drink alcohol and he instead spent the time planning out how he was how he's going to spend his next year he would have a really successful year and achieve all of his goals but if he didn't bother to do that he wouldn't and I was kind of surprised and I was like well this year I'm going to do this and you know from March to April I'm going to do this and that and the other and I've got these kind of goals da, da, da. so there were things that I was I was kind of planning to do um, but at that stage on Christmas day they weren't those kind of fixed New Year's resolutions and last year I set myself some quite um, ambitious New Year's resolutions that I failed at in the first week and they were quite different from previous years when I've set myself much more practical New Year's resolutions like stop wearing red and purple at the same time and stop buying lipsticks, you've got enough lipsticks, just use up the lipsticks that you've got this year. <laughs> As a side note, both of those have been very successful. I try my best not to wear red and purple at the same time. And in terms of the lipsticks, it was literally only six months ago that I bought a new lipstick, like in having used up all of the previous lipsticks that I had acquired. So those were good resolutions, but like running four times a week, going to yoga three times a week and swimming once a week was way too much. <laughs> So as I reflected on what my father-in-law had said to me, I realised that for him New Year's Eve was actually an opportunity to do some goal setting and think about what he wanted out of his life and how he wanted to best spend um, his time. And doing that kind of reflective goal setting is something that I do quite a lot as a student. And also I journal several times a week, not every day, but I journal quite regularly and that's something that I started doing in, I think it was August. 2018 because I, I was suggested to do that by my good mother who's a filmmaker and film writer and she said to me just try journaling stream of consciousness writing stuff down it might help me with writer's block so it's a habit that I have stuck to not every day but quite frequently which is which is really lovely um so doing that kind of reflective goal setting is something that I continue to do and is not limited to new years but Despite that, his sort of surprise at the fact that I didn't have any resolutions um, stuck with me and I ended up setting some. And then on New Year's Eve, as I was, you know, dancing wildly to house music, someone asked me, hey, what are your New Year's resolutions? And I said, oh, my New Year's resolutions are, be prepared, one, stop squeezing my spots, two, submit a paper to an academic journal, three, finish scraping the woodwork in my bedroom, and four, get a dog. And they looked at me and they were like, Oh, those are more like tasks than New Year's resolutions. And I thought, well, actually, they're things that I need to do and I want to do in the next year. So surely that's a resolution. Like, I am resolved that I'm going to finally finish the DIY in my bedroom. Probably not going to happen, but let's just stick with one thing at a time, scraping the woodwork. 
it kind of made me realize that I guess for some people it seems like there's a certain way to be about New Year's resolutions which I think is is not very practical and potentially leads to failure like me saying I'm gonna do all of these different types of exercise so many days a week and not eat any snacks I love snacks um, <laughs> why deprive yourself in January one of arguably one of the worst months of the year um, the other thing that I think is quite different in my life is that I celebrate Chinese New Year um, because my maternal side is Chinese. And Chinese New Year is quite different from the Gregorian calendar's New Year, it's based on the lunar calendar. Also there are, there are lots of traditions surrounding it, there's lots of conventions surrounding it that are much more prevalent in Southeast Asia where we're from compared to the UK. What we have in the UK always feels like a sad, pale, pared down version of the kind of exuberance of like most of a country going into celebration for two weeks if not a whole month. Uh, some of the things that stick with me are, you know, A, it's, it's a changeable date, you're not quite sure when exactly it falls, you have to make sure that you go to the Chinese supermarket and get a Chinese calendar which tells you what the dates are, or you can just google it, but I'm old fashioned. Um, <laughs> yeah, the dates can change, it's not fixed, it's flexible, so you have to be prepared for it. Also about the fact that um, it's about preparation in advance of the new year. So before Chinese New Year, the idea is that you clean the house because during Chinese New Year, you're not meant to do any cleaning because you will be, if you do any sweeping in Chinese New Year, you're like sweeping out good luck and good fortune that is coming to you in that period. Um, I'm just gonna add a little side note. I am not religious, I, I'm an atheist, but these are all kind of cultural, relig cultural, practices which sometimes are inspired by different types of Chinese religions like you know Confucianism or Taoism or Buddhism but it's more about yeah just things that you do in as part of sort of feeling like you're a member of an ethnic group or a culture so it's not really about religion you know you could argue that it's a lot about superstition but it's also about kind of ritual and practices in your life that are beneficial so there's this idea that you're kind of preparing for the new year by doing a lot of cleaning, which I really like. And also when we were younger, there was this idea that um, during Chinese New Year, you'd wear new clothes, which I'm not sure if everybody follows, but in my family, there was this idea that you'd get a new pair of pajamas um, and you'd, you'd sleep in your lovely new fresh pajamas for Chinese New Year. And there's lots of other things as well to do with it. But this sort of idea of renewal, kind of cleaning cleaning out, renewal, and then obviously family time and, and feasting is, is a very, very big part of it as well. Um, so it's quite it's quite similar to Christmas and the Gregorian calendar new year in, in that respect. But I always end up doing clearing out of my closet and cleaning out the cupboards and stuff like that before Chinese New Year because it also coincides with sort of these spring cleaning kind of traditions that you might get in, in Europe, in, in the West, Europe and North America. Um, I guess sometimes spring cleaning could be more to do with like Easter and Lent, I guess. Um, no clue, don't know anything about Christianity bar like what I gleaned from watching TV. So. I don't know about that, but my friends have actually commented, oh, you always do this closet clear out in like February or so. And that's that's because of Chinese New Year. And it's also a time for like reflection. So different strokes for different folks. And I never do anything for Easter or, or anything like that. Like people have asked me quite a lot over my life, what are you giving up for Lent? And I'm like, I'm not a Christian. Why would I give anything up? <laughs> um, yeah, like Chinese kind of festivities revolve around eating as opposed to self-denial. <laughs> which is weird because there's a whole strand of it which is to do with Buddhism. So it's all very contradictory and confusing. But anyway, I think having these different points in the year where you reflect on what you're doing, what you want to achieve, what you might like to change in terms of your habits is, is really good and doesn't have to be restricted to the 1st of January. However, I would love to know if you guys have any New Year's resolutions, how are they going, given that we're about two weeks into the new year, the new decade at this point, is it going well? Do you want to change your goals? And do you have any New Year's resolutions surrounding crafting? 
So that brings me nicely into the next section. It's been all about helpful segues in this episode. Thank you very much to everybody who responded to my last video asking myself and you, can I go slashless in 2020? Um, there were lots of great, great comments and I really enjoyed reading through them. And it really seemed to me that there was this feeling that lots of people would like to try to either knit through their stash and conquer it or knit more of their stash and shop less. And one viewer, Kelly, hi Kelly, commented that we seem to be gearing up for another another group project, another group initiative like the Crimson Whiplong. And I think that that is a great idea and I would love to do something with you guys. So let's get ready for stashless 2020. You can interpret that word how you want. It could be stashless. You will not have any stash by the end of 2020. You'll have got rid of or worked through all of your craft materials. Or you could read it as stashless. 2020. You want to do less shopping, you want to do more of making from what you have, but you might allow yourself to have the odd purchase here and there for whatever reason. So I have opened a thread over on the Ravelry group and this is going to be a year-long initiative that again is focused on community, is focused on chatting to other people, having that spark and sharing what you're doing. So as part of Stashless 2020, um, I'm going to be making a series of short videos about my process, about my thoughts, um, what I'm going to be doing, my aims and my goals. But the main thing to do is just to have a think about why is it that you want to go Stashless why do you want to go stashless? And the reasons are going to differ for everybody. And again, stashless 2020 might not mean knitting up your entire stash. You know, you might not want to stop buying yarn for a number of different reasons. Or it might not be practical. You might have too much yarn and you're just not going to end up knitting through 500 skeins. <laughs> I, I don't know. Another thing that stuck with me was a viewer commented that they've just bought their first sweater quantity after knitting loads and loads of socks and they can't imagine what six sweater quantities look like. I know, I totally agree. I can't imagine it either. And I was so shocked and surprised that I actually found that I have more than six sweater quantities in my stash. I literally don't know how it happened. So I'm going to be doing some videos addressing that side of things as well, like accumulation, keeping on top of things. How did it happen? and I hope that you'll join me for that. So if you want to join in, um, use hashtag stashless2020 on Ravelry, on Instagram, on YouTube, wherever you want. But as with the Crimson Whip Along, I will be hosting the bulk of the discussion over on Ravelry, but feel free to use it on Instagram too. It's a nice thing to do. And just open it up with a post saying why it is that you want to go stashless. So I'll start by giving you a few reasons for me. Firstly, it's to do with space, it's to do with money, and it's to do with time. So that's three reasons. And I live in a small apartment. My apartment is 40 squared meters. I live with my partner and I work from home and we both are musicians and we both have a lot of hobbies. So we are home bodies. I'm much more of a homebody than he. Being in our home is a big part of our life. You know, we're not these people that just come home to sleep um, and like barely eat, no. And I just don't want to be in the situation where my craft materials are taking over the world. So unlike other people, for me personally, knitting is not my main passion in life. It's not my main passion. It's something that I unquestionably have to do. It is part of my life, but it's not what I'm actively like bubbling on up, up about. It's just something that I do all the time. It is compulsive and sometimes it's impulsive. My main passions in life are travel and food and music. <laughs> and I like to spend time socializing with friends. And knitting gets incorporated into all of that. I knit whilst on the train, whilst at the airport, I knit whilst chatting to people. For me, they're not mutually exclusive. So this might be different for you and I think that that is totally fine. It's all about like what's right for you, but it's also a lot about self-reflection. You know, why is it that you wanna go stashless? For me, knitting isn't my main priority in life. It's something that I'll always do, but as such, I 
I feel overwhelmed by the amount of craft materials that I have, despite my ongoing best efforts for the last eight years, I would say, at reducing my stash, I still have far too large of a stash than I personally am comfortable with. And again, the size that you're comfortable with is gonna be different for absolutely everybody. And because we live in a small apartment, like the impact of any kind of accumulation is felt very, very strongly because we don't have the storage space. So it's possible that if I lived in a larger abode, um, I might not feel as bad about the size of my stash as I currently do. It might make me feel less overwhelmed, but I don't live in a bigger house. And also, who knows, maybe, maybe I still wouldn't like it. Do you know what I mean? So just have a think about why it is that you wanna go stashless. So I've mentioned time, I've mentioned money. One of my New Year's resolutions is to get a dog. They're not cheap, there's a lot of ongoing costs, but we're hoping to get a dog from a shelter which would reduce costs significantly. Um, but overall, like bringing an animal in, into your home has a lot of costs and I want to make sure that I'm spending my money in the right way so that I can afford the upkeep of the animal. And I've also mentioned time. Um, I have wasted a lot of time just looking for things that I think I have, that I know that I've got somewhere or I ought to have, and I'd rather just be getting on with the knitting and not like, rummaging around and, and scrummaging around. So those are my reasons. Um, I'm gonna have a post up on Ravelry, as I said, detailing that a little bit more and how you can take part and the kind of guidelines. But this is gonna be a year long initiative in which um, it's gonna be supported by videos on YouTube. And I really hope that you join in and overall just have fun and enjoy making things with the materials that we have already brought into our homes and into our lives. So I'm gonna wrap up there now today. Do, as I said, leave me a comment down below letting me know how you're getting on with New Year's resolutions. Did you have them? Did you not have them? Do you want to make a new resolution for 2020 to join in the Stash List 2020 challenge? Let me know. Um, I always value your comments and your feedback. It's really, really great to feel that we're really building a community around the Crimson Stitch Tree, small and growing as it is. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up below and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you would like to support my work further, you can do so by signing up for my monthly newsletter. The link is in the down bar below. Or you could support their channel by buying me a coffee over on Kofi. I'm delighted to say that over the Christmas period, we hit our Kofi goal, which was saving up to buy a new camera for filming the Crimson Stitchery. As I've mentioned before, I film the Crimson Stitchery currently on a borrowed camera that is not really suitable for filming video. And it's it's really, really problematic. So I needed to buy a new camera. And I'm, I'm so happy and grateful that we have reached the target amount. I will be looking into all of the finances surrounding um, the camera imminently and I'll give you an update on the next video as to exactly how much we've raised and you know after the PayPal fees and all of that kind of thing but a, a big massive thank you to everybody who has contributed to the Kofi campaign and yeah if you'd like to get involved and support the channel a little bit more please feel free to buy me a coffee on Kofi it's not compulsory but it will just allow me to a invest in the podcast and b enjoy the occasional treat so thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon. Bye bye.